welcome to the role of coordinated medical care in the treatment of accident victims post Pebbly B Santa Clara Organics, hosted by us at Injury Institute, the best medical lien provider network in California for your personal injury and workers' comp cases for over 25 years. And of course, our sister organization, the San Diego Injury Network, run by the wonderful Jeff Jennifer Evans, who represents our medical providers in San Diego County. We also would like to thank Expert MRI, California's largest network of advanced MRI centers for being our sponsor today. We have a great panel for you, moderated by attorney John Rice, an outstanding member of CSD and a multiple plaintiff lawyer award recipient. Also joining us is Octavio Aguirre, a medical um, consultant, Dr. Harish Holsakar, orthopedic surgeon based in San Diego, Dr. Amir Hassan Baraman, a board certified neurologist, Dr. Kenneth Light, a spine surgeon, part of the Injury Institute Network in San Francisco, and Dr. Sana Khan, an accomplished radiologist, researcher, and entrepreneur with expert MRI. Thank you again for joining. And with that, I will hand the mic over to John to get us started on our topic today. John, we're ready for you. Hey, there I am. There we go. Okay, can everyone see my slideshow? Welcome everybody. It's going to be a very interactive couple of hours here. What we'd like you to do is use the question and answer portion of Zoom to write out any questions you have we are gonna save time at the end of the presentation in order to allow us to all uh, hopefully interact with the questions that come up. All right, first thing up I'm gonna to try to cover today is some of the basics of Pebbly. Pebbly, I hope all of you have had a chance to look at. It was a seminal case that came down in 2018 and really changed the, um, the basis for the plaintiff's practice as it deals with past medical specials and how in our offices we handle um, getting our clients good access to medical care, not just when they don't have any insurance, but in times when they do have insurance. So I think most of the members here are lawyers and you know there is no substitute for reading the case. Can everyone hear me? You have to read Pebbly. If you don't read Pebbly, you're gonna have a very hard time following along with what has been happening. Okay, here's what the basics for Pebbly is. The basic facts is something we face all the time. You have a plaintiff come in, they have a serious back injury requiring surgical repair. In this case, the Pebbly insured had Kaiser they were insured with Kaiser, but they decided to go out of network to get the care provided on a contractual lien basis rather than use their Kaiser insurance. The case then proceeded to trial and you can sort of expect what happens. The defense shows up and says, wait a minute here, the plaintiff decided to go outside for care when they had insurance, those medical special damages for that care should not be what the doctors billed for the care. It should be what Kaiser would have paid for the care because the person had insurance. In essence, they make an argument that the plaintiff didn't mitigate their damages by using their own insurance. And that was the heart of what happened. And um, if you're familiar with the Pebbly case, um, you know that um, the kudos for this result and everything about Pebbly really goes to the Simon Law Firm. Two lawyers in particular who you have to give a shout out to, Grace and Goody and Sadie Fisher. They were the trial dogs who pressed this issue, breathed the issue and get it done. So um, if you know those lawyers, next time you see them, say thank you. All right, so there's your basic fa facts in Pebbly. 
you get down, you look at the holding of what happened here. And there's some basic questions you ask that were asked of the trial court that we figure out what does the trial court say. First question, did Howell apply? We all know that Howell limits past medical special damages to what you can recover, what was paid in cash if you had a pre-existing contractual arrangement, i.e. if Kaiser had provided the care, what would Kaiser have paid? In this situation, does Howell apply? The trial court holds the answer is no, it does not, all right? Let me back up to that a second again. It does not. And they say, here we're confronted with an insured plaintiff who has chosen to treat with doctors and medical facility providers outside the insurance plan. We hold that such a plaintiff shall be considered uninsured, opposed to insured. That's the key phrase. When they're considered uninsured, you are completely outside of how. What's the rationale? Well, it's really common sense here. There's no pre-existing contract between the doctor who did the care and the patient to get paid. The, the pre-existing contract is you're going to pay for the care that I provide at my charge rates, at my billing rates. When you step into court, that's going to be governed by reasonable value. What's the key? There's no insuring entity between the plaintiff, patient, and the doctors. So the plaintiff is legally responsible for the full bill, right? They are. They got the care. They owe the doctor for the care. And that personal responsibility for the bill is what allows the plaintiff to walk into the trial court and say, if a defendant torted me, they should have to pay what I have to pay for the medical care that was required to deal with that injury. Right, second question. Is refusing to use health insurance a failure to mitigate damage? Trial court, the answer is no. Pebbly had a right to seek the best available care and an incentive to do so. It would be inequitable to classify Pebbly as insured when Pebbly was not an insurance carrier and is responsible for the bills, indeed precluding Pebbly from recovering the reasonable value of the services for which he is liable would result in both undercompensation for Pebbly and a windfall for defendants. Plain, simple, really good language from the Court of Appeal explaining the rationale for the plaintiff's responsibility to the doctor for the bill and therefore, if the defendant is liable, their responsibility to the plaintiff for the same bill. What is Pebbly in the real holdings here? And this is where the court really lays out some of the rationale. There are many reasons why a plaintiff may elect to treat outside <coughs> the insurance plan. Plaintiff generally make their insurance choices before they get injured. These choices may be based on a plaintiff's willingness to bear the risk posed, posed by a health maintenance organization and their rationing systems for health care. A lot of times that's because a plaintiff is healthy and requires little care. This decision becomes much different after a serious accident when the plaintiff suddenly needs more complex and intensive care than the HMO is structured to provide. The plaintiff may simply want to choose the physician or surgeon who specializes in the type of injury, but maybe they don't accept the plaintiff's insurance or any type of insurance. And in care, health care providers who build through insurance may be less willing to participate in litigation. These are all good rational things that you can talk about with a plaintiff who comes in if they have insurance. If they have Kaiser or they're in a healthcare system where it's just really hard to get an appointment, it's really hard to get an MRI, a CAT scan, to get things done, and they're fighting their healthcare system. It's a rational reason to say, I don't want to fight my healthcare system. I'm going to go outside 
go to a doctor who specializes in treating these type of injuries. I'm going to enter into a contractual lien with them in which they'll wait to be paid. And that's the care I'm going to get. That's the care that's going to be presented at a trial against a tortfeasor. So lots of reasons that are very rational for making a decision not to use insurance and to use an outside contractor. This is far from exclusive. I can think of a number of other reasons why it's rational. How about the type of insurance I have may have high deductibles. It may have high co-pays. It may only cover 20% of the care and I'm responsible to come up with the balance of that. There is still in the insured environment an out-of-pocket expense that the plaintiff generally has to incur as that care is incurred. And an injured plaintiff may not be in the position to bear that financial responsibility. That's another rationale for going outside the healthcare insurance system. Okay, when you get to trial then, you're saying, okay, um, I don't have to use my insurance. That's not gonna be held against me. That's not gonna be admissible for any purpose. What am I going to use at trial in order to prove up my past special damages? What's the measure? Well, we all know if you go read Cassie's that the measure is going to be reasonable value. And reasonable value, you're gonna hear a lot about it today um, from professionals who actually testify on reasonable value about how they come up with those numbers and what they mean. And as trial lawyers, that's what you're arguing principally to your trial judge first, and then to the jury, what is reasonable value? So you know you have this bill from the doctor, from the doctor, the surgical center, the hospital, any medical provider. Are those unpaid bills admissible to prove reasonable value of the past med specials. Pebbly says, yes, they are. But there's a caveat that you have to pay attention to. Standing alone, an unpaid medical bill does not meet your burden of proof, right? Does not understand that. It also has to be backed up by a qualified witness giving you expert testimony as to reasonable value. Pebbly is very clear. They say the credibility of the battling experts is within the jury's province. So both sides get to put on expert testimony as to what they believe the reasonable value of this care is. The jury makes the finding of fact as to what that, uh, what that result is. All right, so the answer is clearly yes there. All right. So. In dealing with Pebbly, where, where is the battle? And how has the battle actually worked and hopefully won? In Pebbly, it was done in motions in limine. And if you haven't seen the Pebbly motions in limine, they've been circulated on a lot of the listservs. One of the things we're going to do here at the end of my presentation, you will see that there's a, an email address. Uh, we're going to get together with all of the presenters, put all of our PowerPoints, all of our documentation together, and we're going to get you all a Dropbox link or some other ways you can have access to all the documents. In that pile of documents will be the Pebbly motions in Limbe, copy of the case and a bunch of other documents. So you have good models because, face it, what is the practice of law if not sanctioned plagiarism, right? We don't copyright our pleadings. When you're doing motions in limine, when you're doing motion work, I always start with finding someone else who's already done it and use their work as a model, all right? So what were the motions in limine and how were they ruled on? This was the plaintiff side. The defendants did matching ones from their perspective, but here were the rulings exclude evidence that plaintiff was insured and the decision to take care out of coverage granted by the trial court because whether or not the plaintiff had insurance is not relevant and could be prejudicial. Second motion limine, exclude evidence of what insurance would pay 
for the claimed care. Now, it's interesting here. The court here actually granted that motion in limine, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. And the, the third one, exclude evidence of care provided on liens, that was granted by the court. And to exclude the defense expert's testimony on reasonable value because of lack of qualification. It's a very interesting read in the court of appeal decision of taking the defense expert on a 402A hearing to find out if he's qualified. What the court said is, in this case, there the defense expert was qualified as to the hospital care, but not qualified as to the care and the value of the doctors involved in the care. All right, so how do you evidence reasonable value from the lawyer's point of view? Um, use the law, all right? Um, if you look at, there's a series of case sites that I'm giving you here. This is the, really the law indicating how we should go about doing re reasonable value. And it really is whatever the reasonable market value of the services include the full range of the both the charges and the acceptance of payment. All right. The citation in there takes you to code of civil code of regulations um, 1300.71. And this is a statute that gives you a roadmap. For, for reimbursement, how what are the elements that go into reasonable and customary value? And you can see they detail them here for us. The provider's training and qualifications, the length of time they've been practicing, the nature of the services provided, the fees usually charged by the purveyor in the general geographic area, other aspect, aspects of the economics of the medical practice, any unusual circumstances. I tend to call it the kitchen sink, all right? I think that's the best approach on reasonable value is you go in and you say, look, let's center on, I need a surgery, I need this care in my community. What are the charges in my community? That should actually be key because frankly, the charges in San Diego are different for the same care than in LA. And it's different in San Francisco. Within the LA basin, it's different across the basin. And of course, if you're gonna use, you know, a, a very experienced doctor who has is at the top of their field on something, you're probably gonna pay that doctor more than someone who is not established on the field. That's reasonable. Right? I don't think anyone has any problem with that. What we also do is are there any circumstances of the case? Some of those circumstances are the case is, hey, this doctor charges these rates and it's reasonable. And one reason it's reasonable is he's agreed to wait to be paid until this case is over. And if this case is over, and there isn't money to pay him, let's say that the case gets defensed and there's no recovery. Now the doctor has to chase the plaintiff who remains obligated to them. So the doctors are taking time and risk associated with doing this type of care. And what I always do when I put the doctor on the stand, I go, why do you do care on a lien? And most of the doctors just say, because I just want to help the patient. I just care about the patient. I've found that most doctors, if they are just focusing on patient care, they are so darn busy doing that and providing good care. The finance stuff is sort of, I don't want to say secondary, but it just sort of happens. <laughs> it, it just sort of does. And they make a fine living doing it. Off they go. But the focus is on the patient care. That's why they agree to do it because the patient needs to be helped. Um, the other part of the kitchen sink approach is, of course, is not only what are the charges, but what doctors get paid, right? And doctors get paid, hospitals get paid a wide range of, of payment. They get paid a different payment from Medi-Cal. 
a different payment for the same from Medicare, a different payment from an alternate rate contract with HealthNet or Blue Shield or somebody. Some of them may give a cash discount. The VA may pay them something different. Lots of different payee streams. What I like doing is saying, put them all in. Let's just go out there and put them all in there and say, what is it? And then let's explain to you why what is the doctor is asking for reasonable value here is a really good solid number because there's rational reasons why that is the good number. And as a plaintiff lawyer, you're saying the defendants should pay it, right? And everyone is pulling in the same direction there. All right, little spins there. Like I said, use the California laws as we have them. The other thing that we want to do is in, in, in dealing with contractual liens, right, where we have, I'm not going to send, my client is no longer going to go to Kaiser. My client is going to go see Dr. Light. Hey, Dr. Light, we need to have a surgery. Dr. Light goes right on. I'm willing to do it. Let's enter into an agreement because the doctor needs a lien. The doctor needs an insurance signed by the plaintiff lawyer and the plaintiff that he's going to get paid from the settlement here. And we all see these documents and there's a lot of these contractual liens out there. And I tell you, a lot of them are really poorly written. And from a trial lawyer's point of view, the big problem with the way that they're written is really that they say, uh, this is a lien. It's signed by the plaintiff lawyer. The defense lawyer takes that. He blows it up gigantic, right? He puts it in front of the jury and says, look at this. The, the plaintiff lawyer sent the plaintiff to this doctor. They're in cahoots together, right? Especially with chiropractors. They go, look, it's, it's, a, it's a game. The plaintiff lawyer sends the plaintiff to the chiropractor. The chiropractor does a bunch of care. The implication is maybe all of it isn't really needed. The chiropractor then overbills. It all gets presented to the liability carrier and they get paid. And they use this contractual lien document in front of the jury to try to beat up on the plaintiff lawyer to say that the plaintiff lawyer and the doctor are somehow in cahoots. There's an easy way to stop this. I call it a well-written insurance security agreement. And again, I have a copy of this in the documents that you'll get. And really what you're gonna do is it's gonna be a lien document. It's gonna provide the doctor's office the same legal security to be paid first from any recovery. But what it, so what it does, it confirms the patient's responsibility for the charges, right? I mean, whether or not you recover from the responsible party, the liability carrier, anyone, the plaintiff and the, the patient is still responsible for all those charges. You confirm that the provider will await payment because the plaintiff patient is not at fault. The defendant is at fault and responsible to pay for the necessary care. Just write it in the document where the doctor says, hey, look, the reason why I'm willing to basically extend this plaintiff credit, I'm gonna, I'm gonna provide care without getting paid right now, is because someone else is responsible. There's an insurance carrier who covers that responsibility and they are the ones who ultimately will be responsible to pay. So you put it in it. Uh, we, are, we understand that the defendant in the case is insured by all state and all state will be responsible to pay these bills at the end of the day. We also add some foundation for the charges being re of reasonable value. But when you put all state, all state, all state, four, five, six times in this document, do you think the lawyer defending the case is going to be able to put that document in front of the jury? No, not without confirming to the jury that the defendant is insured by all state, right? What you've just done by simply rewriting that agreement is take uh, this document off the table effectively from the defendants being able to use it. 
And at the same time, what you've been able to do, there's the appearance. All right, who saw that? Anyone catch that? Okay. Uh, uh, what you've done is take it off the table. And uh, that helps immensely at trial in, uh, in, in dealing with this issue um, of defendants using these lean documents to try to beat up on everyone. All right. Um, so what do you do um, to evidence reasonable value? Because we said you have to use an expert, right? You're gonna, you can get the bills and you got to use an expert. So what you're going to do is you're going to use the treaters, right? Use your treaters. If your treaters can't support reasonable value, um, there's an issue. Now, that's not always the case because, like I said, I want doctors who focus on care. And sometimes doctors in their practice are like, look, I got a handle on some value issues, but my life is very busy providing care because I'm a clinician. That's what I do. I don't do billing. I have to pay attention to the business side of stuff, but it's not my preference. I'm a doc. My focus is on care. Find out who in their office is really up on value issues, who's doing the billings, who's paying attention to it, or we use what I would call a good, reasonable value expert, all right? And the next speaker we have happens to be, I think, you know, one of the go-to experts, no matter what side you're on on the issue. His name is Octavio Aguirre. Uh, Octavio, I can't remember the last, the first time you and I talked about this, but I think it probably goes about 10 years back uh, or so. And so um, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Octavio here and he can take us through the rest of this. One last thing for the law geeks, here are the citations for the case law that preceded pebbling. And you want to know these cases and how they work in the materials. I've given you some blue on these cases and how Pebbly fits with them. Because here, here's the question. A people without knowledge of their history are like a tree without roots. Somebody in questions and answers, tell me who that is from. I'll give you a prize. All right. With that, here's your last thing. If you send an email to john at the lean project.com, if you put Pebbly 2021 in the subject line, my uh, bots, as they say, will kick you a Dropbox link. Um, it probably is not live yet. We're going to coordinate to get everyone else's uh, documentation into that Dropbox folder, but this will be one way you can access that. So Octavio, how you doing? Doing well. Thank you, John. All right, here we go. I have stopped my screen share. You can start yours. Take it away. Awesome. All right. Now, Octavio, you can go into presentation mode. Perfect, thank you. Yep, there we go. So hi everyone, I got uh, 10 minutes to explain uh, hospital charges. So um, it's gonna be a little difficult, but I'll do what I can and uh, go from there. So uh, first and foremost, uh, uh, what uh, John said is spot on as far as the reasonable value. Uh, I'm gonna add something to the hospital charges. Um, that's kind of where my background is. Um, I've also worked on the provider side um, with uh, MRIs, uh, physical therapy, uh, physicians in general, just uh, everything. My specialty really is uh, working with spine and, uh, and uh, ortho, so uh, that includes neurosurgeons. But uh, back to the hospital, um, what, one of the things that we really need to understand in, this, in the hospital dynamics is that, um, and I'm gonna, Go to the next slide show. Is contracted versus non-contracted? Uh, we look at a couple of different things. You know, we look at economies of scale. In other words, how many cases are we going to get from this insurance carrier, and what's going to be the reasonable value for that care? Uh, how many lives are they going to give us? Are they going to give us, you know, uh, hundred thousand lives to work with? 
And, um, and we also have to work, be cognizant of the competition. Is the hospital down the street going to uh, contract with the same insurance carrier? So those are kind of important uh, points. Um, and then we look at the timeliness of the payment. Are we going to get paid within 30, 45, and 60 days? Um, and most of them are doing what they call electronic uh, billing, so we get uh, those uh, uh, bills paid electronically. So that, that uh, really saves on the cost of labor for following up on billing, any, any of those type of things. Um, and then from a value standpoint, we do, we do a lot of surgeries at some of the hospitals that I work with, and um, we have to look at the upfront cost. Uh, not only the labor and the OR space, the hardware, rental equipment for special uh, types of, uh, of equipment needed by the orthopedic surgeon or the spine surgeon. Um, and then we also look at the um, contract itself. So this is kind of where I'm going to kind of go off of the, the, um, my PowerPoint and go back to what the reasonable value for hospital. So the way the hospitals get paid, um, we, we're kind of... Uh, pigeonholed to uh, Medicare and Medi-Cal. We have to accept Medi-Cal and Medicare for uh, if we want to have an emergency room. Um, that's just the way the laws work. So we can't do anything about that. So what the insurance carriers did is they used that number to negotiate their fees. Well, that's that's great. And those numbers, you know, the somebody, uh, the CFO or somebody in the hospital has to make a decision on what to go with on that. Um, what my point is in what is reasonable for the hospital is you have to look at uh, contracted versus non-contracted. And in this case, hmm. one of the issues that we run into is that a contracted rate is going to be, we consider a, uh, a contract that takes all these things into account. Non-contracted and out of network is what lean cases are. On contracted out of network, we expect to get paid 100% of charges as a hospital. So if we have a person that comes in and they are not contracted, they have an insurance company that is out of network, we expect to get 100% of charges. So, and this is where the system I think is kind of a little bit skewed in that is these cases qualify, they are in that category. So uh, the reasonable value is what the hospital charges. Um, and I'm gonna get into just quickly why the charges are so high, as people say. Uh, first of all, if you talk to anybody in city government, the highest uh, uh, cost for them doing services is their emergency services. So if your uh, police uh, stations, your fire stations, those are the most costly uh, uh, services that the city has to provide. Well, a hospital has to provide uh, not only emergency services, but they have to uh, provide 24-7 uh, uh, service for people that are staying in their hospital. They have to have, uh, they have to pay for the liability insurance. And we know that uh, hospitals get sued quite often because people die at hospitals and people don't like to see their loved ones die, obviously. So um, uh, also the uh, utilities, uh, backup generators, uh, engineers that have to take care of that, pharmacy, radiology, OR and supplies, medical equipment, uh, beds, oxygen supply, technology, uh, robotic surgeries are gonna be uh, coming to light. Uh, so these hospitals have to in, uh, invest in technology. Uh, we have to have food services, uh, security guards, uh, IT services, housekeeping. This is essentially a city that we have to run and we have to uh, supply those, those uh, uh, services in a reasonable uh, rate and we do the best we can, but those are kind of my points. And like I said, I, I went with uh, uh, and agree with everything John says. And um, we have to look at what the reasonable value is. And my point is the reasonable value is what the hospital charges on these types of cases. And you add the risk of possibly not getting paid for these cases and having, having to track down a uh, their uh, patient or our patient to get that, uh, get those items paid, 
that's an additional cost to us. So we have to not only follow up on, on, the, on the current uh, services, but we also have to follow up on trying to get paid. So um, I'm gonna leave you with that. And I believe my good friend, Mr. Harish Holsacker is going to follow me. If you have any questions, yeah, please buzz me and then I'll uh, try to answer them as best I can. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, uh, Octavia. Well done. Thank Dr. Holsacker, you. you are up, ready to rock. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, guys. This is post lunch, and hopefully, we are not putting you to sleep. I must start by saying that every time I've heard John's talk on Pebbly, I have gotten something more out of that talk. Thank you, John. It's just wonderful talk. I've probably listened to it about five times by now, but every time I get something more out of it. Uh, my assignment for Holsakar, this afternoon is... Dr. Holsakar, yeah. is there any way to adjust your mic? We're having a little bit of interference. Can you hear me now? Um, maybe a little closer. Okay. A little Thank better? You. A okay. little better. Okay. Uh, well, my assignment for this afternoon is uh, to talk about the role of an orthopedist and also obviously the reasonableness of care and expenses. I... I I'd like to begin with this uh, quote as far as this group is concerned. Most valuable resource that all of us have is each other. Without collaboration, our growth is limited to our own perspectives. So let me begin first by talking, what is the role of an orthopedist? Orthopedics is a specialty that takes care of injuries and deformities. So it's an art and science of taking care of injuries deformities, managing them, and fixing them. Essentially, the entire realm of personal injury somewhat, therefore, comes under the specialty called orthopedic surgery. We typically consider the mechanics of injury, and I always like to put Newton's cradle there, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. For every force that gets transmitted at the time of this injury, there is an equal and opposite injury that happens within the musculoskeletal system. For example, this car accident right now, which is a rear ending injury, and you see how the mechanics of the injury can involve anything from the ankle joint up to the knee or to the hip and to the pelvis, and of course, the neck and back. And it's the orthopedic get involved into this mechanics and discuss and describe the causation of these injuries. About seven years ago, I, I got into the concept of multi-subspecialty clinic. Therefore, I created what I consider the injury tree here, where you have a general orthopedist as the trunk there, which is controlling or navigating the whole ship whereas you have a bunch of other specialists, including physical therapy, chiropractic, acupuncture, pain management, spine surgeons, neurospines, neuropsychologists, neuroorthopedists, TBI specialists, biomechanics, life care planning, PMNR, psychology, psychiatry, plastics, neurology, imaging, all coming together to really put together this tree based on the foundation, the facts, and the evidence. In addition, over the past several years, we also added some more specialties on the down left corner, including ENT, dental, GYN, colorectal, ophthalmology, dermatology, pulmonology, and general surgery. I think over my decade of work in personal injury, I've really seen this evolve to include an entire gamut of subspecialties that come together to take care of these patients who've gone through injuries. And think about it for a minute from perspective of your clients. They were just in an accident a few days ago. They're hurt, they're injured, they're stressed out. Some of them lost their loved ones in that accident. They are limping, they're in pain. Many of them have lost their cars or modes of transportation. In COVID pandemics, it's not even easy for people to get Ubers sometimes. 
So to ask one patient to travel to 16 different locations to get their medical care and treatment is often not impossible, but extremely difficult. So based on the concept of convenience, we created a multi-specialty clinic, uh, which includes all the subspecialties that we just talked about under one location, under one banner. Uh, and we work very cohesively with San Diego Injury Network and Injury Network as well to make sure that all these clients and patients are taken care of appropriately under one banner. Now, I want to reiterate some of the things that John talked about because I did have them in my talk as well. But I think it's important for some of you who are listening to maybe note down just five or six of these important things that are important from perspective of the reasonableness from perspective of medical billing. Very important, John mentioned, was training and qualifications of the provider. Two, length of time in practice. Not every single provider is the same. Somebody's just come out of their training or somebody's done this for 25 years with both two different individuals who bill at a different level. What are the nature of services provided by that physician or expert or specialist? What are the fees usually charged by that provider? What has the provider been charging for the past five years, 10 years? What is usual and customary for his or their practice? What are the prevailing provider rates in the community? It's very important as an expert witness to understand, know, and grasp that. And then of course, I added one part which is already included in John's thing, which is unusual circumstances. And I'll go to the unusual circumstances soon. But I have this one slide up, which talks a little bit about my own situation when I talk about reasonableness based on my years of experience in testifying, deposing, and being involved as both the defense as well as plaintiff expert. So it's important to have a comprehensive evaluation at first contact as based on your training qualification and length in practice, those evaluations are really different. And you all, 200 of you listening to this presentation realize that not every single consultation report you receive from different specialists looks the same or reads the same. There is a multi-specialty evaluation required in certain cases. Every person doesn't just have neck and back issues. There are patients who have a chipped tooth. There are patients who have an ENT problem. There are patients who get a massive scar, which is symptomatic and needs dermatology or plastics. There are patients who have a hip labral tear and a knee tear. There are patients who have psychology issues. Finally, having a, a, a comprehensive practice multi-specialty allows us to also offer a consensus opinion. Now, what is a consensus opinion? When multiple board certified specialists in a group offer a consensus opinion on a certain case, it's very difficult for the opposing side or the opposing counsel to counter those opinions which are rendered with say three board certified people in the same practice agreeing to something. They have to actually now get an expert to contest that opinion which is given by three renowned people in the same community, which is a big burden in many cases. Most of the people working in a group of well-known experts and expert witnesses and that matters when you come down to, again, reasonableness of billing and care. We have a vetting process within our system where we vet the cases ahead of time. We help the, the plaintiff, if you may, in terms of, or the plaintiff's attorney, if you may, in terms of understanding our, our own risks or burdens involved in the cases and help take mutual decisions in favor for both parties. And finally, as a group practice, with multi-specialty involvement, we have a balanced approach to a foundation-based care and treatment involved in each patient's individual care. Now, going back to reasonableness of medical care and expenses, with extensive, at my personal level, when I, when I testify, I talk about my extensive clinical experience in coding and billing for over two decades at this point in time. I am currently a multi medical director of a multi-specialty practice, and I oversee the billing and reasonableness of care and expenses for more than 20 providers in our group. As a previous or ex-chief of surgical services at a multi 
specialty hospital. I used to oversee the billing and expenses for multiple surgical cases, different specialties, including hospital and facility bills. And as a plaintiff and defense expert for almost 10 years at this point, I've reviewed thousands of line items of billing over the years, both in our community and also in other states. But of course, what is relevant in our lawsuits here would be our community. And I've reached to trial testimonies for reasonableness of medical care and expenses. So that becomes the foundation, as John was talking about, when you are testifying on either side, the foundation of what your uh, testimony is going to be as to the reasonableness of the medical care and expenses in any case. Let me now take you all to a website which uh, I believe both the defense and plaintiff guys use quite a bit. It's called fairhealthconsumer.org. And uh, obviously Pebbly was a game changer in this case. Uh, I think John's basically discussed a lot of that already. The whole bottom line is the evidence that the plaintiff chooses to treat on a lien uh, rather than to his or her health insurance is irrelevant as we all understand. And that was a game changer. So let me see if I can walk you through some of the slides of this Fair Health and actually teach you how to actually navigate that website. Why is something like Fair Health Consumer important? Because their database is based on, at this point, more than 32 billion claims. And these are claims being processed for healthcare bills. So essentially that database has so much of information for data mining for this. Uh, so like I said, 32 billion private healthcare claims, and 20 billion Medicare claims in this database. This is how they actually go through and obtain the data for their website. So when you log in or pull this up on your say, iPhone or something, the screen you're gonna see on the left is basically what you're gonna see. And in that screen, you first hit the button that says search for medical and hospital costs. And I think both John and Octavio honed something in. They talked about out of network and non-contracted is what Octavio said, which is important because personal injury treatment is not conducted under an insurance. So it's, it's basically out of network. So you ought, to hit, you ought to hit going out of network while calculating the expenses that you're looking for. Okay, so let's go out of network. Then you got to put in a zip code. And just for the sake of it, I put in 92037 La Jolla is a zip code. You can put whatever zip code you want, wherever you practice or wherever the, the plaintiff is residing, just to keep it simple. Then you go on to the next page where you got to select the type of care. So you go to different categories. There's even COVID-19 category now. By the way, COVID-19 adds an unusual circumstance today, which all of you on the legal side have to be aware of. Doctors have had to spend tons and tons of money to maintain practices for COVID-19. We, when we used to see patients previously, you were able to see about 50 patients a day. Now we let one patient in and we see one patient and then that patient walks out and then you get to see the other patient. Not to mention the amount of equipment, gloves, uh, PPE, everything that is spent on each and individual case. So there, I, I believe there's something like a COVID surplus that happens in today's billing as well. Okay, you go to the next one. I just selected orthopedics as an example. And within orthopedics, I then just clicked on injections. Let's just try out a steroid injection and go down to reasonableness. And the CPD code, it, it allows you to pick a CPD code. So we go down to aspiration of injection or, or large joint, like injecting a hip joint, right? And then you hit click and you get the numbers. So again, this does not mean it's a specific single number. There's always a range, but it just still gives you a ballpark that an out of network reasonable number at settlement to at least receive for a hip joint injection, just the cortisone shot would be $2,159. So that's just one example. Now let's go to an office visit. An office visit that takes about 45 to 59 minutes and usually Consultations last for an hour. Uh, those of you who have sent patients to our offices are fully aware of that. So it's a one hour consultation. And believe it or not, out of network for one hour consultation of 45 to 59 minutes 
is $922. Uh, lots of attorneys sometimes roll their eyeballs, especially during settlements, thinking, oh, you know what? Here's 200 bucks for your consult. Well, that's not how it works because this is a range and this is, first of all, after looking at 32 billion data points of entry, this is a average that is presented for this bill. So this gives you some ballpark. And by the way, in the insurance industry and the defense guys use this website as well. So they're fully aware of this website. Uh, and so this is helpful for you to understand when you're sitting in mediations or settlements to at least understand what numbers uh, somebody's trying to push against you. Uh, now let's go to some things out there, and I'm sure Dr. Khan will be happy to hear that. An MRI of the upper spinal canal out of network is billed at $6,190. I mean, that's a reasonable value of that. Uh, injection of the SI joint, one injection of cortisone in the SI joint in, uh, is out of network is $2,179. Uh, an office follow-up consultation. 1,400, uh, office consultation, 80 minutes, sorry, 80 minutes office consultation. Now, here what I did was I changed the zip code. And it's interesting because La Jolla was changed to Poway. And in Poway, 1,479 is reasonable as a consultation for 80 minutes. So again, zip codes can change things, but it gives you the idea of a range there. Um, I'm fully aware, and it must be at least 100 attorneys on these 200 attorney attendings there that uh, we might have discussed what a reasonable office visit could be. Uh, and you know, of course, this gives you again a fairly good idea as to what a reasonable number could be. Now let's go on to a 30 minute follow-up consultation, $839. X-rays, X-rays are very contested sometimes. You know, even though they're billed very minimally, uh, Pretty much in our practice at this point, $75 an x-ray, but up to $996 for five views, which gives you some idea that it's about $200 a pop for an x-ray is considered a reasonable value. Uh, $11,000 for the surgeon fees for shoulder arthroscopy is considered a reasonable value in terms of uh, medical care and reasonableness of cost. A knee arthroscopy, $14,234 would be considered a reasonable number for out of network. An MRI of the leg, an entire leg, which includes the tibia fibula from the knee to the ankle, it's a fairly reasonable extensive examination, but still 8,000 would be a reasonable number in this case for the MRI of the leg. Uh, so this, I wanted to teach you how to navigate the website because it, there's endless combinations. Uh, you, could, you could utilize the, the website freely. It's, you don't have to be, be, to get additional information from the website. We had to actually pay fees to do that. Uh, so sometimes when, when attorneys tell us to give us a report for future care and expenses, uh, uh, you know, we, we go to these websites, we have to pay premium to, to get certain specific numbers that we need because not everything is available for free on the website, but we have to actually spend money to get those reports. And uh, I think uh, most attorneys are aware that future care reports are charged, but that's really the reason why we have to invest time and energy and get these numbers for the attorneys uh, to be able to present that. So again, the most valuable resource that all of us have really is each other. I mean, we all talk to each other all the time. Most of the panel here talks to each other all the time. Uh, most of the faculty talk to each other. Most of the providers are in touch with each other about the reasonableness. We are usually in litigations either on the same side or against each other sometimes, and we all learn and grow, but we all know what's reasonable in our community, and we all know how, uh, how the values are usually generated. So uh, I think I, I have... Uh, I have one minute left maybe, but I'm, I'm done with my presentation. I'll be happy to take any questions uh, at any point. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Holsucker. Uh, fantastic as usual, more uh, incredible data to absorb. And so look, everyone who out there who's attending, um, you know, what you're getting is not just talking heads, right? You're getting real data, real data on reasonable value and how it comes together incredibly valuable. 
Okay, next up, uh, Dr. Brevin, um, you're ready to go, right? Yes, uh, I am. You're on, share away. Okay. Um, everything's okay? Yep, I see you. Okay, Doc, very good. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, I'm Amir Berman, a neurologist, and um, this is, I think, uh, the fourth time uh, we are having this presentation, this kind of presentation in San Diego Injury Network. I'm very happy, very grateful, grateful to be here, and I absolutely love it. Um, um, I am, uh, it's about 16 years uh, I've been in a private practice. It's about six, seven years focused in um, legal neurology. And in the past two, three years, specifically, my focus has been traumatic brain injury. I have the opportunity of working with multiple specialists, the best specialists in town. I've learned a lot and I'm trying to um, do my best uh, for providing the best care and also evaluation and as assessment to my uh, patients and our attorneys working with. Um, <clears throat> I like to um, uh, I like to uh, today we're going to go to the um, uh, neurological testings that um, we are using it in a, a routine daily basis uh, for our patients. I have been given 10 minutes. Uh, I cannot even name those testings. It's, uh, it's not even enough for that. However, I do my best to have a quick touch on the major ones that are very helpful in our practice. So um, basically the testings that we are using in neurology are two sets, uh, central testing and peripheral testings. Central testings, the, one that, the ones that we are using for uh, mainly for the traumatic brain injury and um, the peripheral testings uh, like the EMG testing, we use it mainly for the spine injury or spinal root damage and the diagnosis such as radiculopathy. We do it also for peripheral nerve injury uh, for patient like a carpal tunnel syndrome as a result of a trauma or like a perineal neuropathy, we are seeing it with a dog bite every day. Uh, Again, I'm trying to focus on the central testing today, a couple of them. I'm working on the TBI. The TBI, especially mild TBI, which is, which is the major uh, type of the TBI we're seeing in the office, is essentially a very, very uh, subjective entity. We, are, we know that we are expecting to have all of the testings, imaging, everything, the patient exam, everything to be normal. And this is the case. However, when we have a high case value, when we have um, a lot of uh, uncertainty about the diagnosis, that's the time we get to the challenge, we get to the trials and those things. So my job and my mission is to try to do everything I can and bring subjectivity and also a right and clinical diagnosis for both sides, for defense and plaintiff. This is what I do. So um, I'm gonna go through the central testing um, that we do. Uh, basically EEG or electroencephalogram or conventional EEG, quantitative EEG, video nystagmography and also posturography for balance assessment. So this is the um, this is the the EEG, the routine and conventional EEG we do every day. I am doing it probably seven to ten cases a week. We see the patient in our office. We put and place uh, twenty pairs of electrodes in certain part of the brain, as you can see, and then the the uh, information is going to be transferred to amplifier, and from there is going to go to a software. And then we're gonna see a digital tracing and recording as a result of this um, um, process. So you are seeing a lot of oscillations, frequencies and waveforms, very boring. However, this is what we do every day. So basically the frequencies that you are using and you are seeing in the brain are mainly five ranges of frequencies. 
and these are named delta, theta, alpha, and beta, and mu. So we know that every part of the brain, each part has a specific frequency in different uh, states of arousal, drowsiness, sleeping, or awake. And we know that what part should not have what kind of frequency and what part should have that kind of frequency. For instance, if you're seeing the delta frequency, one to three hertz in the frontal area, each line, as you see, is representing one area of the brain. We know that this is not normal. We should not see this. So this is representing a problem in that part. It could be anatomical. It could be physiological. That's, we know that. This is how it is. So um, the first time, um, I think, if I'm not mistaken, 1940, the EEG was used for uh, evaluation of a traumatic brain injury for the first time, 1940. However, one of the best data and also registry we had uh, was from 2000 to 2012 done by the Department of Defense, VA, and also US Army Research Laboratory for put all of those data together to come and see, okay, what's the difference? What's the, what, what we are seeing on the EEG for traumatic brain injury in the combat soldiers? So to come, to come up with a better uh, definition and also diagnostic criteria. Uh, definitely they saw the differences, especially the patient with a PTSD, which are very common problem with the patient with a TBI. They were able to see the differences of the oscillation and those frequency activities in different parts of the brain. And we, I don't wanna go through the details, but we call it the slowing or hyperactivity, which is um, very, uh, sometimes uh, difficult to diagnose even for the trained neurologist like me. Um, <clears throat> we are seeing different abnormalities and findings in the TBI with conventional EEG, including a focal slowing and also um, in different part of the brain. We can see abnormalities even the first several hours from the injury. So we don't see the patient in the first hours in our practice. As this is, we are talking, we are talking, and we're dealing mainly with the mild TBI in cases. Usually, we see them sometimes days or months after the injury. So they have done a lot of the study and have come up with prognostication value for the EEG testings. And more importantly, we can see epileptiform and seizure activities in these patients. So post-traumatic injury and post-traumatic epilepsy is not a post-traumatic epilepsy is not a common thing. We don't see it every day. However, it's a very important su a subject and it's very helpful for um, um, those cases with which we're gonna see the prolonged disability. Uh, so this is the screen, the digital screen I'm doing it every day and I'm seeing it every day. You're seeing six, seven seconds of recording, a lot of oscillations, a lot of waveforms, so boring, but this is my job. I do it every day. So I'm reviewing 30 minutes of this recording. You're seeing six, seven seconds. I'm, see, I'm doing it 30 minutes of recording. For me, it takes about three, four minutes. I've been doing it for 16 years. It's so easy. My eyes have been trained to do it quickly. However, and what if I have a software and technology brings those, all of those waveforms you can see here, give me a mapping of the brain and showing, okay, the frontal part has five to seven hertz, eight to eight, seven to nine hertz, this part of the brain and this part, and then give me a kind of new, uh, uh, a numerical, a nominal kind of evaluation of the waveform instead of doing it based on the visual inspection. So, and what if this um, software and technology brings it uh, to another context and compared with the normative data for the normal population? And then if we bring this technology and compare it with the patient with traumatic brain injury, that would be wonderful if we have such a thing. And this technology is called quantitative EEG or QEEG. This is something that I started recently. It's about one year I'm doing it. It has been significantly helpful for our cases, especially the cases that we are debate and 
and they're subject to litigation. Again, everything in mild traumatic brain injury is supposed to be normal. Even conventional EEG is normal most of the time. However, when we bring those objective testing, such QEG, we see the value. So uh, <clears throat> again, um, there are a lot of things about the QEG. I don't wanna go through those things, but I'm gonna mention a couple of those things. One of them is coherence index. And also the other one is QEG discriminant function. So those are two major indexes. We check it in the, uh, in the quantitative EEG. So the, in the coherence part in index measures the neural network connectivity and dynamics. If you really look at the, the, the diagnosis and also definition of the mild traumatic injury is disruption of this neural network. So basically this part is working on that. It's amazing index. The other one is discriminant function. It's a big, big thing. Uh, I, I cannot explain it right now, but it, it brings air, all of the aspects of the uh, mild traumatic brain injury or severe uh, traumatic brain injury. It's, it's a classifier. It's gonna compare it with the normal data. It's gonna compare it with the neuropsychological testing even post-traumatic coma and the length of it and GCS scores, so it's amazing things. These two things, these two indexes are, um, was, uh, were actually invented or uh, I don't know, they found by this guy, Mr. Dr. Thatcher. Dr. Thatcher is a legend, is not just expert, is a legend in the uh, TBI and neuroelectrophysiology. And I think he's, in the uh, late 70s or, or probably early 80s, believe it or not, he is still practicing. He's in New Jersey. I am in touch with their lab and clinic once a week at least for my patients. And I'm using all of their data and diagnostic tools and also the software for my patients. It's been very helpful for me for a lot of cases. So, so what if this technology yeah, instead of the number, give us a mapping of the brain. So you see that different part of the brain with different colors and every, you see that the frequencies for the frontal part, for instance, here, occipital part, and you see that it's like a weather map, like a storm going on. I'm seeing, I'm sure you're seeing it in the weather every day in the morning, Fox News, this is likely weather, a kind of storm coming in. And, and it is real storm. This is real storm. This is one of my actual patients. A 56-year-old woman came um, to see me from the attorney, referred to directly from the attorney, very low impact in the Walmart parking structure. The patient was carrying the, sh the shopping cart, getting to the car was hit by another car in a very low impact kind of fashion. So it was a legit case. The patient came with significant leg injury and also symptoms of the brain concussion. It turned to be of a, a leg injury turned to be a Krebs CRPS and also this concussion we evaluated, we came down with a diagnosis of TBI. Everything was normal, EG imaging, normal imaging, but with the other testing, and especially this one, a quantitative EEG, which was positive. And you see that this area was totally abnormal. And then this is the same patient. So we have a 3D kind of, uh, kind of um, uh, luxury imaging of this patient. So this area is the damage, is a left uh, frontal parietal area that we are seeing abnormal. This is the Z score. Again, I don't want to go through those details. I don't want to um, give you a headache. However, this is very interesting for this patient. So far, the case after nine months settled with a seven-figure case with a third part car, uh, the insur car insurance. Now they are negotiating with Walmart for the, another second or seven figure. So we, for those high cases, these are so important. Um, let's talk about another testing. I'm trying to go fast. Uh, hopefully, 
Um, if there's any question, definitely let me know. And after this, we'll go through the questions. Yes, so, Dr. Barman, um, we're running a little bit low on time. So how many we'll minutes? Just, um, it's past time, but go ahead and um, just finish uh, up your presentation. Sure, Thank you. I'll do it. I'll do it quickly. So, uh, so I'm sure you have seen a lot of patients with, and you have heard a lot of patients with the TBI and they have dizziness, okay? Dizziness is one of the most common. It can be 80 to 85% of the patients. And this is one of the major risk, factor, risk factors that can predict a prolonged recovery. So um, what we do with the VNG testing is called video nystagmogram, which we're checking the vestibular symptoms. I'm sure uh, the vestibular system. I'm sure you're ordering and you're seeing the orders for vestibular therapy every day, but we need to know what it is. So there is a very nice, very delicate circuitry between the inner ears, the brain and the eyes. So basically this is the ear system. This is outer ear, this is the middle ear when you get infection all the time, but this inner ear is part of the brain and you see the nerves going toward the brain. So again, there is a very fine connection between these three systems. So when you have a trauma, a subtle trauma, such a traumatic brain injury, this system get interrupted and becomes too problematic. There is no imaging showing this problem. Everything is gonna be fine on MRI. However, we know that this system is defective. This major part, the major reflex of this system is called VOR. It's called video, sorry, vestibular ocular reflex. This is a very important thing that we assess with this testing and uh, it can be very impaired. The signs of impairment of this, uh, this reflex is difficulty in walking, dizziness, and blurry vision, difficulty maintaining balance, and also head, abnormal head movement. Sometimes because of it, disruption, we can see constant and persistent nausea for the patient with concussion. So what we do, we bring the patients to the office. Uh, we are having um, a specific uh, clinic, we have a specific kind of a, like a uh, setting for this uh, testing. The patients are, uh, we're using a camera uh, and a goggle camera. Then all of the data during different head position is gonna to go to computer and computer and the software is gonna analyze that and we're gonna get the very fantastic 25 pages of report about this um, uh, system, the vestibular system. Again, for the uh, TBI, everything, my TBI, I'm talking about the my TBI, everything is matter of subjectivity. If we can bring objectivity, definitely we are enhancing the case. So what is, uh, what is helping us this VNG testing basically brings objectivity to the case. And also we can use it for prognostication uh, purposes and also for the follow-up. A lot of, uh, we don't do it, but a lot of people are doing this uh, um, for the regular um, cases with a vestibular uh, rehab and see the results of the improvement um, and the vestibular rehab. This, a study can be done by um, VNT specialists. However, we are specifically doing it for the TBI with a special setup for that and the diagnostic values for that. Um, Perfect, Dr. Barham, this, this. thank you. Thank you so much. We're, 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 we're behind here. We're gonna move a little bit forward. There is gonna be time at the end. Sure. And, and again, I know for, I, I can't believe the amount of stuff that I'm learning here. Um, <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it's amazing. And, and the nice thing is everyone will have access to all of the PowerPoints as well. So Absolutely. I think when people digest all of those, we're gonna see a lot of questions. If you look in the Q&A in the chat screen, people are writing questions on this stuff to you right now. So when we're done with the presentations, we've left about 15 minutes to deal with some of those. But uh, right now we need to move on. We've got two more presenters. Dr. Kenneth Light, um, you're on. Thank you so much for your patience and uh, go ahead and share your screen. Uh, you have to take yourself off moot, Dr. Light. Um, 
I still have go. Dr. Uh, Berriman's screen on my computer. How do I get rid of that? You have to share screen. If Got you it. hit, if we go, you Got share it. your screen, Got take it. it over. Okay. Well, I really appreciated uh, Dr. Berriman's presentation. Uh, I learned a lot and I've learned a lot from all the speakers. <clears throat> I am not going to teach you anything. This is meant just to be entertaining. Um, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I've been in practice in uh, uh, the Bay Area for 30 plus years. <clears throat> I do spinal surgery. And uh, the purpose of this is just to tell you that um, <clears throat> Uh, it, I'm, we're very fortunate to have Pebbly because many of our patients would not have any treatment were it not for Pebbly. There seems to be a built-in bias uh, uh, toward uh, spinal injuries uh, just to say that uh, it's a sprain or a strain and uh, uh, these patients are just uh, looking for money and are half crazy and uh, don't need to be treated. I am just going to dispel that myth for you by this presentation, and I'm gonna go extremely quickly. I came across this um, <clears throat> video. Dr. Light, a, we can't see your screen. If you could try the share screen like again. That. Okay, let me see what I can do here. Uh, okay. Share screen. Okay, now we got it, I hope. You should have it now. There you go. All right. Are we there? Perfect, thank you so much. Okay, so this is a video of a, uh, a, of a low speed motor vehicle accident <clears throat> and uh, common arguments for uh, defense lawyers are, well, the, um, uh, the cars were not going very rapidly. There's not enough energy uh, to damage the spine. Uh, this is a rear end collision staged at six miles per hour. And it's very graphic. Uh, there's the collision. Now you can see what happens to the occupant and, and only a six mile per hour collision. Uh, if you look closely uh, and in slow motion, you can see uh, what happens to the head and neck uh, you can see the patient's hair being thrown back and you can see the seat being pushed backward at only six miles per hour. Uh, you can look at her face and you can uh, determine that uh, this was a fairly violent collision at a relatively low speed. Uh, and this is the mechanism by which many of our patients are injured. Um, what gets injured in a rear end collision? Uh, it's usually the disc and it's usually a uh, results in a herniated disc. There are different types of herniated discs. Of interest is the fact that the herniated disc was first identified as a cause of neurological injury only uh, in around 1934 uh, at the Mass General Hospital by Mixter and Barr. This gentleman, who is a uh, Scottish orthopedic surgeon, moved to Toronto and did animal experiments with monkeys on sleds for whiplash type of injuries. And uh, he um, determined, and this is known that uh, <clears throat> rear end collisions uh, result in uh, injuries and uh, the force applied is equal to the weight of the head and the uh, speed of the vehicle. Um, after they um, uh, dissected uh, specimens, monkey specimens, they found that tears of the longus coli muscle um, were seen, and these resulted in retropharyngeal hematomas, which commonly result in difficulty swallowing. This is a symptom that uh, very many doctors don't understand. Uh, they, uh, the uh, injuries to the longus coli muscles resulted in uh, damage to the sympathetic chain, which resulted in vertigo, which many patients with whiplashes have, uh, and um, also, uh, they found uh, injuries to the vertebral arteries, which resulted in ringing of the ears. This is a specimen that was harvested from one of the monkeys attached to a sled, and you can see the actual pathology. Uh, this, is, this is a pathology that you cannot see on an x-ray, and that's another problem because motor vehicle accidents uh, result in patients going to emergency rooms. We have x-rays. The x-rays rarely show anything, but here you can see how the inner vertebral disc 
is separated from the vertebral body uh, as a result of a rear end collision. What happens is there's a, a force that separates the cartilage from the bone. These things rarely heal. Also, there is a hemorrhage uh, uh, behind the esophagus uh, from the longus coli muscle, which results in difficulty swallowing from these injuries. This is a herniated disc that was sustained as a result of a motor vehicle accident. Here you can see the piece of cartilage, which has uh, escaped the disc space and is pushing back on the spinal cord, which results in spinal cord compression. Um, it's interesting that uh, this uh, investigator reviewed 575 motor vehicle accidents. They followed 145 cases for two years and found that 83% of the uh, patients still had symptoms despite settlement of the litigation. Um, I want to show you just one case now, and this is will um, pretty much uh, be the end of my presentation. <clears throat> Uh, it demonstrates um, how orthopedic surgeons uh, think about things. Uh, this is a patient who was uh, on a chair, slipped down and landed on her buttocks on the floor. And she sustained a herniated disc at what we would call the L5-S1 level. This is the L5 vertebrae. This is the sacrum. And here you can see this is the L5-S1 disc. There's a piece of um, uh, cartilage that's pushed back uh, onto the nerve root. Uh, this patient happened to have numbness on the outside of her foot, a loss of an Achilles reflex, which is consistent with um, pressure or damage to the S1 nerve root. Here you can see on the right side, this is the S1 nerve root. It's the nerve that goes to the calf, the little toe, and is responsible for the Achilles reflex. Here you can see on this side, we can't see the nerve because of this piece of cartilage that uh, has pushed back onto the nerve. This patient went through extensive conservative care and wound up having a laminectomy and discectomy, or another word for saying that would be a microdiscectomy uh, to relieve the pressure on the nerve. This is a, um, uh, a, a, a time-honored treatment for this type of problem. This brings up the question and, and the issue that uh, I would like to um, uh, tell everyone about because one of the myths and one of the questions that everybody has when a patient is injured is when do you require surgery? And um, uh, I've, I've been thinking about this for the last three days. There are actual, actually seven indications for surgery, which I will um, uh, spare you, uh, spare you the, uh, the, uh, me naming them but I, I boiled them down to three indications for surgery. And this is a, uh, a, a thing that everybody should keep in mind. And this would be a reason, these, these are the main reasons in my practice over 35 years why, why patients have surgery. Uh, the first one is level of pain. If the pain on a scale of zero to 10 is uh, seven or above, uh, it's really not worthwhile continuing, continuing with therapy or chiropractic treatment or pain management for that, for that uh, reason, because the level of pain of seven to 10 makes it very difficult for a patient to live with the symptoms. Uh, the second num uh, top reason why patients have surgery is their level of disability. Can a patient work? If a patient can work, in my practice, they don't have surgery. If they can't work, they almost always have surgery. And the last indication and uh, primary indication is the need for narcotics and does narcotic medication uh, cover their pain adequately. Uh, if they need uh, uh, two or three narco tablets or, or narcotic medication every day, they need surgery. It's uh, of interest is that this patient um, had surgery. She had the operation I discussed, laminectomy, discectomy. Uh, uh, she was okay for a month. Uh, the pain came back again. She went back to the doctor. Uh, he did a microdiscectomy the first time. Uh, and uh, sure enough, uh, the, uh, the herniated disc came back because the doctor failed to remove enough material inside the disc space. She then had another microdiscectomy she was okay for a month. The pain came back a third time. And again, more tissue uh, came out of the disc space and, and compressed the nerve. 
This is one of the biggest problems with uh, the microdiscectomy, in my opinion. Uh, it's good because it creates a small hole in the spine. It doesn't produce much damage, but there is a very high incidence of recurrence. In this particular case, uh, it's my opinion, uh, and I performed probably three or 400 of these surgeries, that either a fusion or now a, stabilize, a stabilizing procedure called a disc replacement uh, is the best operation. And I personally believe disc replacement uh, is a, a very, very good operation for, fa for salvaging failed surgery or for patients uh, who have uh, ongoing back pain following an accident. I'm just gonna show you this very quickly. This is the operation itself because people are really interested in this. The disc replacement uh, allows the surgeon to remove the disc, decompress the nerves and stabilize the spine at the same time. The patient is placed in the supine position on the operating table. He's intubated and uh, we use a C-arm. Uh, this is the incision. It's, uh, it's made in the front on the abdomen, and it's only about two or three inches long. Uh, the anterior approach to the spine is much less painful than any kind of posterior approach or laminectomy, in my opinion. Uh, what happens is the uh, skin is incised. Here you see the covering of what we would call the um, rectus abdominis muscle. Uh, no muscles are cut during this operation. Uh, the rectus muscle is red, it's pulled aside, and then we see this fat, which is called the retroperitoneal of fat, that's pushed aside, and the abdominal contents are just retracted, uh, and uh, we don't go through anything, we don't take the abdominal contents, put them on a table like some people think, uh, and here we see the actual disc, the L5S1 disc. This is a screw placed in the disc just for marking the midline, which is important in this operation. And here you can see the entire disc has been removed and these little fiber structures in the back represent the posterior ligament. The entire disc has been removed without retracting the nerve and without creating scar tissue uh, in the um, uh, spinal canal. These are the end plates or metallic pieces that we use to uh, uh, for the artificial disc. This is a polyethylene core that we put between the two end plates. The two metal end plates are placed between the vertebrae, the sacrum here and the L5 vertebrae here. And uh, this is what it looks like uh, after the pieces are in place. Uh, this is the uh, disc replacement and this is what the x-rays look like. You can see inflection, it moves forward and extension, it moves backward. This happens to be the patient. Okay, and I'm going to so quit this is here. Lorraine Coran. She's now a little over two months following a disc replacement at L5S1. Lorraine, uh, tell me a little bit uh, quickly what happened to you before you had the disc replacement. Before I had the disc replacement, I had had two microdiscectomies, and they both failed within 30 days. Um, and uh, they had more discs coming out? Oh, absolutely. There were pieces that were still in the canal. And so um, what... Um, uh, kind of pain where you went before you had the disc replacement? It was debilitating pain. I worked through it, but it was still debilitating. And you had pain in your back and legs? My back, both, both legs, uh -huh. yes. And on a scale of zero to 10, what number did you give your pain? I was running between a seven consistently to a nine. And were you able to work? Um, barely. Okay. So, so you had the disc replacement, and tell me a little bit of what that was like. The disc replacement was a two-part procedure. The first was the back, um, went in and took out the stuff in the back, all the scar tissue and the excess disc that's still in the canal. And then the second day was the front. Um, it was the first time I'd been cut on on the belly and that was the new experience for me, but within three weeks I was back to work. Uh, and uh, now it's two months and on a scale of zero to 10, what number would you give your pain? <laughs> like less than one at this point and it's intermittent. Okay. And you have the sciatic pain? No uh, longer. Mm -hmm. Could you stand up for me? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And uh, could I see you walk on your tiptoes? Walk. Mm -hmm. Now walk on your heels. Could I see you bend down and touch your toes? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Come on up. And you do strenuous work now? I do. I, and, uh, uh, what are you able to do now? I can move uh, salt blocks, 50 pound salt blocks for my critters. I can move um, 50 pound bags of feet for chickens and donkeys and goats. Well, I still be careful about that. <laughs>
So with that, um, I am going to stop. Um, um, the message is that um, <clears throat> most pa all patients are treated conservatively. Uh, we only operate on patients who have had failed conservative treatment. Uh, they have to have severe pain. They have to be disabled. Um, and um, they, have, they usually take narcotic medication. Those are the patients best, um, best uh, uh, seen for surgery. Um, I, I, I like when patients are sent to chiropractors and therapists, uh, uh, and uh, most people get better. Uh, few patients require surgery. Uh, the disc replacement uh, is a very good operation in this particular arena because um, it solves a lot of the structural problems with right. the spine in a very short time and allows the patients to return to work. Perfect. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Light. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it. All right. Hey, we're heading to the end here. And of course, what do you always do? You say that at least the most entertaining, I wouldn't say the best, but at least the most entertaining for the end. And that is Sana Khan. Um, Dr. Khan, I know you're up and ready to go. So but take you know, it away. And then you know when we're laughing. done with that, we're going to question and answer session. So you know, I'm laughing, John. So, so Dr. Light said, you know, you would not learn anything, but you'll be entertained. And Honestly, I'm telling you, this, that was in a very gross way, extremely entertaining. Um, so, you know, thank you for that. Uh, just a couple of quick points. Uh, you know, you showed a six mile per hour accident and people poo poo that kind of stuff. But the question I ask is how much force does it take to bend steel? Okay. And so when cars actually get bent, you, you have to understand how much force that is. And that's being transferred, like Dr. Holtzacker said, with the Newton's law, that force is being transferred and it's being transferred somewhere. And often it's pretty much the force experienced by your clients, okay? So let's not poo poo the, the low speed, understand physics wise what's actually happening. Um, and so, so uh, and, and Dr. Amir, I really enjoyed your talk, uh, honestly. So, so I'm gonna try to see if I can wrap all this stuff <laughs> as quickly as I possibly can. I'm amazed at the fact that I thought I was gonna be last, no one's gonna stay around. And I was looking at the numbers and everybody stayed around. So kudos to all of you for entertaining everybody. Thanks, you Dr. Light. Okay, so I am supposed to talk about uh, understanding the different types of diagnostic imaging available and when is it medically necessary? Uh, so Again, bear with me, I'm gonna go fairly quickly because I just, uh, I wanna leave some time, of course, for Q&A. Um, so look, in, in terms of medicine and science and technology, we are coming, we have come such a long way and we have a, you know, a lot to go, but human imaging has become spectacular. Um, so we have x-rays now, CTs, MRIs, we have PET scanners, ultrasounds, right? All kinds of techniques that we have available. But primarily when it comes to personal injury, you know, we talk about x-rays, CTs and MRIs. So I'm gonna just really kind of focus on that. Uh, each one of the talks that you saw today for the 15 minutes could be an hour or more all on their own. So I know they're all going really fast, trying to share as much information as we can. So hopefully you will have access to all of the slides and you guys can spend time on your own. So x-rays. Uh, it's not uncommon. People say, oh, you know, why do an x-ray? Let's go to an MRI. And I, and I don't think that's really accurate. X-rays still have a place in our imaging uh, world. Uh, and particularly when we're looking at penetrating injuries, when we're looking at, you know, foreign bodies, when we're looking at fractures, uh, x-rays really are the first line of, of imaging. Uh, and of course, the orthopedic surgeons always, you know, and our chiropractors always utilize them. And Dr. Holsaker, I will not forget that you put imaging last on your tree. I noticed that. I'm extremely offended <laughs> and depressed, but we'll talk about it a little later, okay? So, <laughs> you, you, you didn't think I was going to notice, huh, Harish? I did. <laughs> okay, so CTs. Uh, so look, CAT scans are, are your modality of choice in a TBI scenario in a hospital, right? So somebody goes in with trauma, goes to the ER, um, when there is indication, your ER doctor is going to request a CT scan, okay? Now, it is not uncommon at all that when I'm finding pathology on the MRI and the deposition, the defense attorney will say, Dr. Khan, you know, what are you guys talking about? The CT was normal in the ER, okay? So let me kind of address that in a fairly quick fashion. 
Now, what we have is typically in a car accident is a coup counter coup. And you guys, you guys all understand that. I don't have to you know, belabor that point, but please understand something. Coup counter coup is not just front and back, okay? Coup counter coup can also be side to side. It all depends on the angle of the movement and shaking of the head. So what happened is that you have the cerebral gyri, which is the brain, actually impacts with the inner table of the skull. So depending on where that, because there's space between the skull and the brain, the brain continues to move when the skull stops, okay? Now, I wanna give you something really interesting. Look at this CT scan that was done on the day of the accident, okay? This is, again, I'm, you're not a radiologist necessarily. I don't want you to necessarily, you know, get lost in this, but I think, I think that you can appreciate this. See this brightness here and the brightness here? You see that little brightness there? I can kind of see that right there, right? That, you know, like, uh, uh. but you know what happened? This is actually the day after the accident. Okay, so if we had just, if we'd just done, a, done a CT and often they get called normal because on the CT scan, you're not going to see the details of these hemorrhages, particularly when it comes to micro hemorrhaging. Okay, now the argument will be is that, well, the CT scan was normal, then why would patient actually have TBI? And Dr. Amir here will tell you that you can have TBI without necessarily imaging showing that, particularly when it comes to CT. But keep one thing in mind, if the CAT scan was done in the ER, that is indication of the ER doctor suspecting TBI. So just because it didn't show up on the imaging on that day here, day zero, that doesn't mean that the patient didn't have TBI or have hemorrhage in the brain, okay? So it's very important to understand a, M a CT scan done in the ER is actually uh, something that you should take very seriously, even if it's negative, okay? Now, let me tell you further that a CT scan can in fact look, you know, not a heck of a whole lot going on. Although I can tell you, you know, my little bit of trained eye. Yes, I would call that. I'd say there's hemorrhage there, right? But look, looks pretty normal, but not on the MRI, okay? Now MRI, a traditional T1, T2 weighted imaging, is, is important, but I'll tell you why that Dr. Amir was saying often that the MRI can come back negative as well, but that still does not mean the patient doesn't have TBI, okay? So, but keep in mind, we're talking about acute TBI, right? And unexplained CT, get an MRI done as soon as you can, and I'll show you in a minute why, okay? Now, there are different types of MRIs. And so the question is, which one should you order, when and how and where? So as a radiologist, I can tell you right now, um, there are three types of designs on MRIs. Here's a donut one that's closed, which is a high field scanner, typically 1.5 to three Tesla. Then you have these open low field scanners open to the side, you know, and then you have mid field scanners called upright um, with the magnets vertically placed. So. I have my preferences depending on what injury we're looking for, okay? So when we're looking for brain imaging or brain injuries or abdominal injuries, talking about chest and abdomen and pelvis, I really prefer the high field scanners, particularly when I'm talking about bleeding or if there is aneurysms or I'm talking, or I'm worried about cancer and metastases and things of that nature where I need to really make sure that I get the sharpest imaging possible. You, will, you really want to get the high field scanner. Now, so let me talk to you about that a little bit now. What was I saying in terms of normal MRIs? So uh, look, CT doesn't show much, but here's MRI showing you hemorrhage. But here's the problem. Blood on MRIs actually, not just MRIs, blood actually with time changes composition. And it, it goes from early on, very early on, day one or two, for, from being unpaired in oxyhemoglobin, it goes to dehoxyhemoglobin, methemoglobin, hemochromes, or hemosiderin, as you call it. How does this transformation affect the MRI? So in your traditional T1, T2 weighted imaging, here you have, look at the graph on the bottom, T1 weighted imaging and T2, these are your normal sequences for MRIs. This is dark, this is bright. This is dark, this is bright. So look, at what happens where blood is the brightest on both T1 and T2 weighted imaging, okay? Day seven to 28, between really one week to four weeks. 
But look what happens to blood after four weeks. It changes the composition and there's a cliff and immediately, very quickly goes to becoming dark, both on T1 and T2. So we often cannot see the hemorrhage on a traditional MRI if it was done you know, two months out, three months, whatever it may be. And the MRI report comes back normal and Dr. Amir is scratching his head saying, goodness, on my examination, this person has CBI. On my EEG, I know there's something wrong here and yet the MRI is showing normal. So luckily for us, we have advanced imaging techniques. And the way we do this is we actually, as long as my doctors, this is, the, this is why all of the doctors are talking about communicating with each other. It's very important. If Dr. Halsaker or Dr. Amir, right, lets me know, or Dr. Light, hey, Dr. Khan, I'm suspecting a TBI, mild TBI at least in this case, can you do the specialized sequencing for it? I can. If I do susceptibly weighted imaging, SWI, I can actually see micro hemorrhage. What does susceptibility mean? It means basically because, because blood has iron, when you have blood that goes extracellular, that iron gets deposited, which then interferes with the MRI signal. And I can capture that if I do the right sequencing for iron, okay? So you can see that pretty clearly. I can actually see these petechiae and there's micro hemorrhage here. But if somebody tells me, please look for that because with, otherwise I'll do T1, T2 weighted imaging and perhaps you get a normal MRI of the brain. Here you actually have diffusion weighted imaging. And here, you know, I can tell you on T2 weighted or T1 weighted imaging, uh, you know, is there really ischemia? Mm, you know, muscle menos, I can tell you, I would probably call it in 70 specialized imaging, but maybe, you know, uh, normal traditional doctors or not radiologists can't. But if I do, S or I do D DWI imaging, any jury and judge in, like, can see that there is ischemia in this particular patient. Okay. So also we can do tracking of nerve fibers and see if they actually are torn with something called DTI. My point being is that I'm not getting into the physics of all this stuff right now, given that with five more minutes to go, <laughs> but I will tell you right now, just let us know what you're looking for and radiologists really have a lot of techniques to look at these kind of injuries, particularly when it comes to TBI. Okay, when it comes to musculoskeletal imaging, my favorite by far, and I own all three types of machines and we get paid the same on all of them. So, but personally, I really like musculoskeletal imaging to be done in the position that's causing the symptoms. Somebody comes to Dr. Hoseker and says, my back really hurts doc, right? Or Dr. Light, my, my back really hurts when I bend. Why would you image that patient laying down? not complaining in the laying down position, right? Basically saying I hurt in a specific position or they go to serve in a tennis match. It hurts when they do this. Well, I wanna image them in that position. So the upright MRI with its front open design allows me to actually put the patient in those positions. And I can tell you right now, the cases after cases, you know, not in every case, but in a lot of cases, we see a difference between your non-weight bearing versus weight bearing. The difference published article, this is from Oxford, the least amount of difference is, they saw in this review paper was 52% of the time, clinically relevant injury was being missed when the patient was non-weight bearing, okay? Just to give you a real quick image, and again, you guys aren't radiologists, but I can tell you right now, here's a recumbent scan. Alignment looks pretty good. You, of course, you have discs you can see in the back. Spinal cord, cauda, cauda looks okay. Same patient, in, within 10 minutes, weight bearing, sitting upright, look what happens to the alignment, right? Complete shift. And then you have the spinal cord and the cardiopana actually hitting the disc. It's the cord hitting the disc, not the disc hitting the cord from the change in position. You can actually start to appreciate spinal stenosis on this patient and instability. So it's not like you're gonna miss, you're gonna get 50% of the time normal reports. It's just that 52% of the time, you're gonna miss injuries that should have been reported had, been, had the patient been done in a proper position. Here, you would not have caught any of the disc herniations that we see in this patient in upright extension. That's where the symptoms were occurring. Large disc herniations, multiple level spinal cord compression, completely looking normal in your flexion view on this patient. And we always get flexion views pretty much when we do cervical spine because there's a pillow underneath the patient. So there's almost a little bit of a flexion when we do that. So here, this, is, this was published out of University of Louisville, out of Kentucky, their neurosurgery department. They published this. This was an upright, not neutral scan right here. Large disc herniation here, 
Here's their spinal stenosis, cord compression. But the problem was this. Not only did the patient have the disc here, there was another disc above. And until the patient went into upright extension, that disc was actually hiding itself or had set in. So it's important to scan the patient in the position of symptomatology. Here's a knee without weight bearing, with weight bearing. The posterior horn of the lateral meniscus is about ready to fall off. The alignment looks really, really off. A shoulder without the position, positional change, we would have missed the labral tear. And last but not least, we can do really heavy patients. We can do children without sedation in the Shmithi, and we can do typhotic patients. Or patients, for whatever reason, cannot lay down. You can actually sit them down and do the MRI. I did it within my 15 minutes. <laughs> okay. Yay, wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Khan. I learned so much from that. <laughs> oh, I can breathe now? Can I breathe? Yeah, okay. <laughs> yes, right. of course. And John, are we ready to answer some questions? I, I think we are. We have a few. I'm going to encourage everyone to put your questions. If you have questions, put them in the q and I've compiled a couple of them here. Uh, first of all, we had a question from Christopher. I think this is probably to Dr. Light about um, uh, uh, your disc replacement surgeries. The question was, um, you effectively, how many have you been involved in? How many you have you done over what period of time, and uh, you seem to be um, uh, very, uh, um, you've had good results, and you're an advocate for it, and um, I guess uh, this is a quick time from Christopher said that he's gotten some other opinions from doctors who are sort of pushing off the idea of disc replacement, so could you share with us sort of your boots on the ground or fingers on the spine experience? I will. Um, so um, <clears throat> I, I performed more than 10,000 spinal fusions in my life. <clears throat> and um, there are some advantages to spinal fusions. However, they make the spine very stiff and it produces a stress riser at the adjacent disc, meaning there's increased force and it causes premature wearing of the adjacent discs. My first disc replacement was in 2005 which was the lumbar spine. Uh, in the United States, uh, I started doing disc replacements in the cervical spine in 2007. I've done between lumbar and uh, uh, cervical more than a thousand disc replacements. The bottom line is that the results are just better with disc replacements. The, uh, the operation is less painful. The recovery is much quicker and the return to function is much better. The need for further surgery is much less. Um, I started doing them because the results were simply better. Uh, in this country, the reason why disc replacements are so slow uh, taking hold isn't because the results are not better. Uh, there is a conspiracy by the insurance industry to prevent any new technology in this area. And in workers' comp, uh, workers' comp still won't approve a lumbar disc replacement. They recently just started doing cervical disc replacements. But for the patient's sake, uh, the operation is better. Uh, it's less painful and the recovery is better. And with over a thousand cases and having done 10,000 spinal fusions, I think I'm in a pretty good position to recognize this at this point. All right, you know what I call that? All you attendees out there, straight talk, right? That's what you get right there. That's what you get by attending and showing up at things like this. Real docs telling it how it really is. That's um, right. Here's a uh, here's a uh, here's a question on um, on on imaging, um, and this is from David Hoffman. Who, if David, you're still on. If anyone knows David Hoffman, he David Hoffman knows more about this than any lawyer in California. He has a question: Is an abnormal VNG that shows central vestibular path, uh, pathology objective evidence of a TBI? This, this is a question for me, yes? Yes. This is, I think this is a question for me. Yes. Problem, okay. yes, sir. <laughs> so, um, the, first, first of all, I have to say that 
The VNG testing basically is looking at the electrophysiology in that vestibular region that I discussed about and I showed you guys. So any pathology there, like a brain tumor, can cause abnormal VNG. Any problem, an in infection in that area, and meningitis can cause this. So a lot of viral infection can cause abnormal vestibular function and VOR, as I mentioned. The thing is this, we have to put the VNG information in the right context in order to make that diagnosis, the diagnosis of TBI. Again, it's a super, super subjective. VNG is very helpful for us. In the VNG testing, it has six uh, kind of sub items in the VNG testings. Two of them are mainly for the peripheral involvement and two or three of them, actually two of them mainly for the central involvement. In the TBI, most of the defense lawyers and the trial cases, they like to see central involvement. However, it's wrong. I can show you, I had it for my board exam. I can show you the articles. There's a website, I'm having it very soon. I'm gonna post all of those nice articles. You can have peripheral and central abnormality in the VNG testing in the context of TBI. So it depends how you interpret it and how you bring it in the context. All right, uh, Dr. Khan, I think this one is for you. Um, talk to us a little bit about the difference in the strength of the magnets in MRIs, um, about upright MRIs and being 0.6 to 8 Tesla magnets, recumbents 1.5, 2 and 3 Tesla magnets, and where's the happy medium if there is one? Uh, okay, so so just in a very quick sense, um, the imaging quality is essentially based on three things on MRIs. One is the field strength, which is essentially thinking uh, about eight cylinder engine versus a, like a high field scanner, a mid cylinder, uh, six cylinder engine, like a mid field scanner, and a four cylinder engine would be a low field scanner. And the kind of software that there is that's analyzing the images coming in, and of course, the coils that go around the body part, that's the antenna. So three things account for imaging uh, sharpness, okay? So a 1.5 or 3.0 Tesla machine is going to have sharper images typically than a mid-field scanner, like the 0.6 or the low-field scanner, for sure, the 0.2.3. Uh, so that's why I was saying that when I'm looking or small, like I really, that, that granularity matters where I'm looking for metastases, where I'm looking for small micro hemorrhages, when I'm look, then absolutely, uh, if you have to knock the patient out and give them sedation and put them into the machine, um, even though they're possible, really that's the machine you have to use, okay, because it's the sharpest. Now for, and Dr. Light may comment on this too, when it goes to surgery, he needs to have the sharpest possible image. So then if we've done the scan on a, uh, midfield scanner, like the upright, then he may want to repeat his MRI to say, okay, I want to make sure that I have the absolute detail of this disc herniation, okay? Or whatever the abnormalities he may be looking for. However, when it comes to grosser parts, such as a disc herniation, or if you're looking for spinal stenosis or instabilities, things of that nature, I would personally prefer, because of science, it's not like hey, the published papers on this, that I capture the pathology even if it's not as sharp. Because what's the point of getting a sharper normal when it's really not normal? Does that make sense, John? Yeah, yeah, that, that absolutely. It, it's always been confusing to me because a lot of times from the lawyer's point of view, you know, the, a doctor says, hey, I need to get an MRI. The lawyer ends up getting involved to sort of help make that happen because it, there's got to be a lien associated with it to make it happen. And there can be a sort of lost in translation. What type of MRI? How good is the MRI going to be? And for, for me, it's one of those examples of you really have to have good communication amongst yeah. your team. And, and having, you know, a, someone's got to be quarterbacking this. And it doesn't mean all providers agree on everything. It, it, oftentimes that is absolutely not the case. Um, and, uh, and that's where I think, you know, one of the things Dr. Holsacker is, 
is sort of, I don't want to say pioneering, but has a little bit of a corner of the market of he's a quarterback and, and that quarterbacking is so important. Your primary care physician who is in a medical practice, who is dependent on insurance carriers who they have these alternate rate contracts with is in a very poor position to be a quarterback on really complicated matters. And so, you know, uh, everyone, all MRIs aren't the same. That's, that's the real thing. And then, you know, in retrospect, when we're done here today, I'm going to go back through Dr. Khan's full PowerPoint and digest a little bit more. So I have a better understanding of that. You, you know, I'm getting a lot of that in the in the q a and in the chat of nobody's had enough time today <laughs> they want to hear more on a lot of different things and so um we're already in discussions of on the pebbly side on the legal side pebbly happened in 2018. a lot of practical things have happened in the handling of this pebbly issue in claims processing and then in your trial situation, in the relationships between the lawyers, the patient, and putting together the doctor teams. Um, and I think we're gonna do a part two of Pebbly in which we really drill down into a lot of those issues from the practice management side, of, side on lawyers. But part of that, of course, is this relationship with the providers who are providing the care and the relationship amongst them. And in, in that way, uh, you know, doctors on behalf of the lawyers who are principally, I think the people who are attending this, uh, you know, can't thank you enough for, uh, for pre presenting today and for your willingness to help patients who are involved in tort claims. And, um, so there we are, Audrey, I see you pop back on. I think you're going to kick yes, us off. Yes, John, that was perfectly put. Thank you so much. And I, I just want to thank you again, John, our moderator, as well as our wonderful panel. You all were fantastic. And um, any questions, any further questions that anyone may have, you can email events at Injury Institute for any of the presentation materials you saw here today. Um, also, if you want your MCLE credits, Give us about three weeks processing time, um, but send us an email and I'll make sure you get that. So thank you again, our panel, and thank you to our sister organization, San Diego Injury Network and Injury Institute, together as well as Expert MRI, our sponsor. So with that, thank you again for coming and have a great one, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.